Virginia men's basketball coach, this was sudden. It's not health-related. It ended up being what I first kind of thought, that we are seeing coaches, like, leaving the game quickly and earlier. They've made millions. And maybe I, I didn't want to, like, jump ahead. It's his decision. Not everybody likes the way he's discussed it. Here's Tony Bennett. Probably the thing that has choked me up the most and the hardest thing to say is when I looked at myself and I realized um, I'm no longer the no longer the, the best coach to lead this program in this current environment. And if you're going to do it, <laughs> you, you got to be all in. You, you got to have everything. And if you do it half-hearted, it's not fair to the, the university. And, and those young, young men. So, you know, in looking at it, that's what made me step down. I saw Scott Drew. Uh, many coaches uh, tweeting out about what Tony Bennett represents and how much they like him and, of course, won a national title in 19 with Virginia. Um, not everybody likes this decision. It's not their career. It's his. But people can have an opinion on it at Tony Bennett. Craig, your thoughts? We, we discussed this yesterday. The good news is not health-related. It appears as if it's just the way college athletics is today. I mean, yeah, I think that uh, it's still very strange timing. Like, you just now figured that out a few weeks before the season started. You got all the way into mid-October and decided that you're no longer the best guy for the job. So, um, you know, I commend him for doing what he thinks is best for the program. I don't know the man from a hole in the wall. Um, seem to be a lot of people who respect and like him, so I'll default to that. He's obviously a very successful coach, um, has been – you know, on the top of the mountain and whatnot. But um, I think it's also kind of easy for guys to say now, like, oh, it's just this the game today the way that it is. Yeah. I feel like that's maybe being used as a bit of an excuse nowadays. I'm glad that it's nothing health-related. Thank God for that. Uh, but I think the timing's still very strange. I don't know how you got to October 17th and you're like, hey, the season's a couple weeks away. I don't think I'm the guy anymore. That's that's just weird to me, but I'm glad that it's not anything more serious. Well, it also allows, uh, because of the timing, Virginia has to promote somebody, and I'm sure Tony Bennett maybe thought about that too. Uh, unless, and maybe he's talked to the, uh, who is now the interim coach for the uh, 2024-25 season. Dan Wetzel, good friend of ours of the show, Yahoo Sports. Good for Tony Bennett, recognizing the job isn't for him any longer. 1,000 others will beg to replace him. But to quit on the eve of the season after recruiting a team to play for him and now leaving them stuck is terrible. Yeah. He could have transferred into retirement in April. It makes yeah. absolutely no sense. And and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know why the timing was what it was, but I, I don't like the timing of it at all. And, look, I, I'm not one of these, like, pushy writers who's like – I'm the moral high ground, and yep. every I'm not that guy at all. Like, do what you got to do for the best of you, but it does suck for the players. I mean, they've been practicing with this guy all summer long. They're two months into the the semester, and you know, all of a sudden this has dropped. So I don't know what it was. Like, maybe this there was signs this was coming. Maybe they already had a good idea of that. But I still feel like actually to hear that it's not a health issue or it's not some sort of scandalous thing actually makes it stranger. <laughs> because those would at least explain why you would do it so abruptly. But maybe it's not that abrupt on their side. Uh, regardless, a lot of people, you know, wishing him the best. And I know that this will be used like, see, this is how chaotic college basketball is now. But well, I don't know. I, I think that's some of it. I don't think that's that's necessarily the full explanation, though. Here's Ross Dellinger from earlier today. College sports has been unwilling, unwillingly shoved to the brink of professionalism through court orders and state laws. The industry is now immersed uh, immersed in an unregulated system because its own slow evolution. Former AD Kevin White telling me last fall, I'm indicting everyone, including myself, because of the lack of really, there were, and I know some people get upset when I said this in even 2020 or whenever the, the, the NIL thing came up first about guardrails, uh, not just to help it's not to protect the schools. It's to help protect the sport. I also saw someone also mention this is that it's interesting because Tony Bennett just got a, an extension and a big fat contract extension. He surely didn't mind that, which is a part of also college sports with coaches getting these enormous salaries. Yeah, I mean, the timing here is so suspect because now he gets to essentially pick the replacement and it still stays in house and 
all that, like, that's that's the only problem I have with this. I mean, I, it, look, if he can't do it anymore, then congratulations for him for stepping away because there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of coaches who have lost their fastball but still kept hanging on until somebody, you know, put them out of their misery, essentially. I, and, I would say this if it was Scott Drew today announcing or yesterday announcing yeah. his retirement on the eve. Again, the timing, if it was two months ago, a month ago, maybe not quite as harsh but it's on the eve of the season starting that first week in November. Uh, from David Teal, from Virginia AD, Carla Williams, when people like Tony Bennett exit men's basketball, exit our industry for something that has nothing to do with coaching or teaching or being a role model, then shame on us. So that's from the AD I don't know how at I Virginia. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I mean, like, well, we're not asking you all. No, no yeah, I that, mean, like, but that's just her, that's her yeah, opinion. Yeah, I, we'll I, feed, I, I, think I, I think I disagree with that part of it. Okay. I mean, like, if, if he wants to go, you know, it, it it's not – yeah, and look, maybe, maybe she is right. It's definitely – like, the fact that you've got coaches who don't really want to do this anymore um, is the NCAA's fault. Um, the NCAA needs to admit that it's their fault. I think the and National Association of Broad, uh, Basketball Coaches put out a statement saying that they yeah. love the game the way it is, but, yeah, there's things that obviously yeah. could be different. So, yes, like, it's the NCAA's fault. Like, everything is the NCAA's fault because of an absolutely historical lack of foresight uh, on their part. And It wasn't even a lack of foresight, or, though, Paul. Like, they it, knew what was coming. They just didn't give a damn. Yeah, like, they just said, like, hop, we're just going to play with our money until you force us to not allow us to – it's like they – they were going to let that ride as long as it could, their whole grift. But they eventually, like, they eventually, the court said, no, you can no longer do this. And that's when they finally said, you know what? <laughs> Looking at it now, we've really been running this wrong. And we suddenly, yeah. amazingly, magically realize the spot that we put our – it's like, oh, yeah, now that you basically had the gun to your head – and we're told, like, may, like, this is the way it's going. Then you suddenly had this big awakening of yep. how like, – so I don't no, buy any this, of that yeah, crap. Abs- like, that's agree. such – that's garbage. Yeah. I don't buy any of that. No, they'd rather still be the old – what it is uh, back in the day. Uh, another note, great coach, great dude, but quitting two weeks before the season with no health issue is lame. The game hasn't changed since June when he signed a contract extension and players transferred – transferred – to Virginia to play for Tony Bennett. Game has not changed in the last three or four months. And here we are today. Tony Bennett, I, I don't remember ever having a chance to, to bump into him or Virginia during a tournament. They won it in 2009. He had a great career. How about this stat about him? And in the chat room, you guys, again, someone said the epiphany. Um, Tony Bennett won six NCAA tournament games. How many do you have to win to win the national title? Six. Six. That's the only time. Yeah. He's in the tournament quite a bit. Uh, in the tournament quite a bit. He's got six NCAA tournament victories, all of them. Listen, if I only have six postseason tournament wins and they're all in one year, that's a damn good year because that means we won the national title of whatever team. Paxton, good to have Craig and Smokey back on Fridays. Paul? Are you happy that we're – okay, that's what I thought. I mean – I know you guys did – the inmates have been running the asylum while we've been gone, but oh well. All right, uh, so there's all that. BYU tonight playing Oklahoma State. Here is another nugget on BYU. Greg Rubel, and he even says this, he goes, he's got an intern that comes up with all of these stats about what they've done as a football team. Craig, you mentioned their turnover margin earlier uh, maybe even it was this week or sometime last week. But here's another nugget about BYU football. Their opponents have had more drives that end in a turnover than a touchdown or field goal. Now, you sit there and you think that, well, that, that probably should always be the case. Nope. 18% though turnovers, 14% touchdowns, 14% team score kick field goals, including turnovers on downs. BYU opponents turn the ball over. of their possessions more than any other drive outcome on downs, along with, of course, not scoring whatsoever. And the defense has been amazingly stingy. Yeah, they're a really good team. Looking forward to tonight. I've thought about it a lot uh, because the chaos, you know, lover in me uh, would want to see Oklahoma State win this game. Uh, The put the Big 12 in the best position possible side of me 
knows that BYU needs to win this game for the conference's just overall standing. And again, I'm not going to be the guy who's like always parading like the the best thing for the Big 12, but I do think at this halfway point, when you're looking at the landscape, the best thing for everybody involved is for BYU to keep winning um, and until at least to the Big 12 championship game. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, if Oklahoma State were to win tonight, that'd be great. That'd be amazing for Mike Gundy and company to pull a win out of nowhere, especially on the road at night in Provo. But having thought up long and hard about it, I just don't see the situation in which they do. I, I just don't know how they do it. Ollie Gordon's one of their captains tonight, I believe. So there's the answer on, you know, how healthy he is, and that's a good sign. Um, we know Rangel's getting the start. What we've seen hasn't been good did against you, this defense. Did you notice that Flores didn't even make the trip? I didn't notice yeah, that. Yeah, no. I, I got that note. Yeah, he did not even make the trip. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that answers that. And that's probably smart on Gundy's part because if he's there, then you're going to have all the people on Twitter watching the game like, where's Zane Flores yeah, at yeah. that whole time? Uh, clearly, he does not believe Zane Flores is ready, Oklahoma State fans. like, and I, I, I mean, as much as you might be second-guessing Mike Gundy or questioning him about maybe the way this team's constructed or maybe some of the decisions he's made, I'm not going to doubt him when he clearly does not want to play this guy right now because he's not ready. So, um, yeah, probably best to leave him at home. But I just don't see a scenario outside of the, the Cowboys like playing out of their minds for the first time this year where they get the win tonight. I mean, it's going to be stacked against them, not only being on the road, night game, midnight, or vampire Cougs and all that, but they're just playing a better team who's getting really good quarterback play and who's getting great defensive play. Um, maybe getting a little bit of a run game going. We'll see. Um, but Chase Roberts and company, guys like that stepping up and making plays. There's a lot to like about BYU and not a lot, a lot to like about Oklahoma State. So with uh, – you know, Oklahoma State getting a couple weeks to prepare for this one. I'm, I'm interested to see what they've got to throw at it. It's got to be pretty much everything and the kitchen sink, one would think, to get a win tonight. Well, and, and another thing that BYU doesn't do because of what Greg Rubel and what Craig, you've mentioned, what couple of, they don't turn the ball over. Now, you never know. One night you just, you woke up on the wrong side of the, or you slept on the wrong side of the bed or pillow. Uh, and, and you have one of those days where you just slop it around or you, not because of the weather, uh, you muff a punt. So that's always the possibility to help they, maybe kickstart a team like Oklahoma State that's struggling. Look, they need all of that. Like, every bad thing that can happen to BYU, Oklahoma, it's, Oklahoma State's going to need it tonight uh, because they've got a problem at quarterback. Do we know if Ollie Gordon's going to play or not? I just said he is. Yeah. Oh, he is? He is? Okay. Yeah, he's a team so, captain. Yeah, so uh, Ollie Gordon is, is playing tonight. But has that mattered all year for Oklahoma State? Not at all. Uh, their offensive line's bad. Their defense is even worse. And – you know, I, I this is this is not the place you want to be when you're trying to pick yourself up off the mat. A nine fifteen Friday night kickoff in Provo. The Vampire Cougars, I mm -hmm. love that. Uh, Baylor experienced that what last year, two years two years ago, uh, when they went to BYU in that that uh, double or triple overtime game. Um, so there we are with that game tonight in the Big Twelve, Oklahoma State, and the Nugget from Greg Rubel, the voice of BYU. How about West Virginia? There is a uh, company called Crowdfund that has secured money to fly a banner above the stadium tomorrow in Morgantown, fire Neil Brown during their homecoming game. S. Michael DeHart, good friend of ours, we have a lot of West Virginia fans who watch this show, uh, sent that note to me. I'm not into that. I know that that's, that can happen. I get it. But... Uh, Man, I think that press conference earlier this week, if people weren't already a little frustrated with him saying, hey, it's a great atmosphere, enjoy it, tailgating's great. I mean, you can go to that. Uh, I think people are kind of almost to the point, well, some are fed up, and then again, Ren Baker's going to make that decision. I mean, I, I don't like this for Neil Brown at all, uh, but it shows you the position they're in. They beat the teams they're supposed to beat. Anybody who's slightly above their level, they haven't jumped up and got them. And... That's what will get you when it is, you know, when you're you're just kind of an above average program right now, uh, which is what they are on on the field. Like right now, they're totally average. They're what three and three, right? Yeah. So um, at three and three, you know, you're going to have this kind of fit. And he he went nine and four last year and calmed him down. But the sentiment was always there until he went, unless he was going to compete for the Big Twelve this year. That was going to be a problem. Now look, if they win against Kansas State, you know, they still only have one Big 12 loss, and that was to Iowa State. So as long as they keep winning oh, they, in the Big 12, they can jump, right back, they're, they're, they can jump yep. right back in the conversation. I don't think fans feel like that right now, especially after Iowa State um, just 
punked them last week at home. No, fans are tired of uh, not winning games that matter. Uh, they want to win yeah. the Iowa State game against a ranked team. They want to beat the near top 10 team at home and not walk away uh, disappointed once again. So last week was a bit of a boiling point of here's this massive opportunity. Let's finally take advantage of it. And then you whiffed again. And now you turn around and here's a massive opportunity tomorrow against Kansas State. The good news for West Virginia is after this weekend, the schedule lightens up pretty dramatically. I mean, you've played three top 25 teams up to this point. You do, though, however, have three road trips in those five games. But at Arizona, they're okay. At Cincinnati, they're a good team. Like, that's dangerous. But I don't think West Virginia fans are feeling like you can't win that game. Baylor at home, winnable. UCF at home, winnable. And then at Texas Tech at the end of the year, that's probably the most difficult game on paper remaining on their schedule. Um, so it does lighten up a little bit, but I know that's not – it's not about, like, the the wins over – like, it's, that's not really what they're pissed about right now is what it's going to look like. They're pissed about right this second. Penn State? Yeah. And Pittsburgh? Choking Iowa away State? the Pittsburgh yeah. game. Uh, uh, not winning that one was, yeah, certainly a, a thorn in the side that otherwise they're sitting there at, like, 4-2 and two right now. Uh, but, you know, that, that stuff happens, so we'll see. Maybe they turn around tomorrow and beat K-State, and then that looks really dumb to have that, that banner flying. But I certainly understand it. I've been talking about, like, that, that seat's getting hot again, boys, these last couple weeks. Um, and so that was a, a bad showing last week that I think just popped the top off a lot of feelings that have been somewhat bottled up recently. Um, and we're back to kind of where we were a year ago when he was very much on the, the hot seat in the eyes of the public. So they, they need to perform well, and, and really they need to get a win tomorrow. If they can do that, then a lot of this changes. But if they don't, then it's only going to ramp up, even though the schedule will seemingly lighten up a little bit. Sam Kahn will join us to open up our guest here in about five to six minutes. He, uh, of course, will be on video. How about this stat? This blows my mind. And, and Ollie Gordon. Last year ran for 1,732 yards and 21 touchdowns and won awards, won a lot of them, up for a lot of them, even the ones he didn't win. He has 384 wins, uh, 384 yards on 101 carries. Do you know what's the most yards he's rushed for in a single game this year? It's under, it's not 100. 76 yards yeah. in a game. That's the 49, 41, 42. 53 on 11, 13, 17, some carries. What is going on there? Uh, it is bad. They are ranked 124th out of 133 teams in FBS football in rushing yards per game. Yeah, he's not been good. Um, won the Tyler Rose uh, Earl Campbell Award last year, uh, which was cool to see that just from being a little bit a part of it. And people loved him. Uh, and he had an awesome year, and obviously the Doak Walker and all of that as well. Uh, couldn't have seen this coming, although I will say now, in hindsight, we didn't talk about this at the time. And I'm not saying that this is the reason why things aren't going well, because clearly it's not an Ollie Gordon-only issue. It's not like Alan Bowman's throwing three, four touchdowns a game, and if only they had a run game to complement this incredible aerial attack. Like, it's not that. The offensive line's not blocking and... They're not on the verge of winning the Joe Moore Award right now. Like, the defense is not doing anything to help you at the moment. So, they have more problems than Ollie Gordon. But do y'all remember the kind of attitude around Big 12 Media Days? Oh, yeah. He had a guy with him that I guess was his agent. Mm -hmm. And there was just a different feel to it. And we didn't talk about it at the time because it's like there wasn't really a reason to. Avery Johnson had his girlfriend there. And I think he had a, a representative or so. At least it appeared that way that was walking him around. So, it wasn't like Ollie was the only guy. But all he had, like, a person or two that was with him, and it just felt very much like a guy who'd had a big year is now dabbling with an agent in this NIL era. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple people saying, like, that's, that's kind of interesting. And then I remember talking to somebody who had dealt with Ollie and talked about, like, having to talk to a representative and just how it was all sort of strange. And... And there's a lot of guys out there that have reps now. Like, they have to because of NIL deals and, and everything like that. But, um, yeah, I just remember that. And you look back on it now, you're like, huh. Like, it's, it's just interesting to look back on and, and wonder, 
does the business side have anything to do with the struggle? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. is just the focus was not quite, like, I don't know. But you look back on that now and you're like, yeah, he was a little bit caught up in the whole agent thing and having a hangers on. And I get that when you're on Super Bowl Radio Row, but not when you're a college football player. It's just still new to us yeah. to see that. And so I look back on that now and maybe it has nothing to do with anything. I don't well, know. And again, like one of the other things is that you have to have a, a little bit of humility in that he had a great season. He won a lot of awards. Jeez, yeah. But how many great seasons has Ollie Gordon had? One. One. Yeah, I mean, just. And if any of all that other stuff you're talking about, Craig, is true, and, of course, your facts, data, you know, evidence, uh, you wonder how some of the NFL scouts will think about this. Well, too. and the reason that we all fawn over people at Radio Row, like when, when Emmett Smith or, or um, you know, Barry Sanders or somebody, like, walks in and we all run to get interviews with them, it's because they stacked a bunch of those in a row. Yeah, no, they did it. Yeah. 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 No, and, those guys all had, like, 1,000 yards, 8 to 10, 12 uh, years in a row. Uh, yeah. So I will ask this to Ollie Gordon. Do you want to be the guy who, when you're uh, – Interview opportunities come up, people run to you, or when they come and you go, would you like to go Ollie Gordon? And we go, you know what? That'd be fun. Sure. Yeah. We got time. Yeah. Sure. Bring him on over. Yeah, he's one of those we just get. Here, here's yeah. a note. I just got this in my Twitter feed from Michael Penny. Michael, thank you. So this weekend you have Georgia, Texas. That in itself is a monstrous deal. Eminem and Sting are in concert this weekend in Austin, and so is Formula One. That's a mo- That by itself is a huge deal. The average, and this is from Michael Penny, the average hotel room cost for one night, guess. Uh, eight hundred dollars. Craig, I, I know I just thousand bucks. I don't $1, know. Sixteen hundred dollars. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now you could have gotten one for one hundred eighty nine at a Sheraton, or maybe three fifty eight at someone. I mean, sixteen hundred dollars. Some of it because, of course, supply and demand, and also because they can't. F one Formula One at the Circuit of the Americas. Uh, oh, game day also is going to be there. UT Georgia Sting and Eminem. What a weekend in Austin, okay. Texas. What would your first choice be? I know what Craig's that. is. Yeah, it's, I'm going with Slim Shady. Yeah. That's oh, Eminem. Question. Eminem. Uh, probably for me would be Sting. Yeah. I mean, I really, there when I've worked out or I've had to run, and I, I don't get to run as, at all now pretty much, I would listen to Eminem. Yeah. I would listen to Eminem. Such intense, high throttle beat to it and i would i would uh i would listen to him but yeah i i what would you want to do eminem oh eminem for Garrett? sure honestly i would go to the game all right well there wow. you go i yeah. would yeah i'll go to the game first uh okay so uh, we'll have sam Kahn coming up next there's a couple other nuggets ad now pittsburgh has their ad we'll have that plus much more